Mary Powell, thanks so much for coming on to Talk Leafs to speak about your experiences as a house parent at a Christian reform school. So before we make a start, could you just tell us a little bit about you and your background? I grew up in Indiana and I went to school in uh, the town that I grew up in, in Marion, Indiana. And um, the New Horizons house parents would bring their kids to the church that I went to. And so I uh, kind of got to know a little bit about them. Uh, prior to that, though, I had worked at for a lot of uh, different a lot of different places that dealt with teens at risk or or young people that were um, emotionally troubled or whatever the catchphrases were, but I only in you know supportive roles and that sort of thing, like for a summer, like a summer camp and that sort of thing. Like I worked at a summer camp for kids that were um, inner city kids from Chicago and that sort of thing. We take them into the woods and have camp, you know. Um, so I did a lot of that. I was very much interested in that. I was very much interested in being a missionary. So I was a Christian, a very dedicated Christian. And I spent a little bit of time in a missions organization. And when I came back, I was just all jazzed and ready to go. And so I was looking for some kind of mission, you know, and I um, knew a little bit about New Horizons, just enough to sort of feel like that was kind of up my alley, you know. I was 22. Well, Escuela Caribe was a reform school, a Christian boot camp, so to speak, down in the Dominican Republic, where young kids and teens were sent by Christian parents who felt their behavior was unacceptable or perhaps not Christian enough. Uh, we got an insight into that camp in the documentary, Kidnap for Christ, of course, which you appeared in. Um, Mary, before we talk about what it was like working at Escuela Caribe, can you talk about how you heard about this behavioral modification camp, how it was represented, and why you went to work there? I uh, attended a church, and the school in the the campus of New Horizons Youth Ministries in Marion, Indiana, where I was living and went to church, um, the house parents and the kids would all attend local churches and the house parents would bring them their kids to our church. And so I got to know the kids and the house parents talked to them a little bit about it. I was under the, I was kind of under the impression that this is a, a boarding school for kids that were a little, that were hard to manage for their parents. All the weird, um, ins and outs of the program were not displayed in public ever. So it was the only way that you could really get an idea of what was, you know, what the school was about really was to talk with the staff and because the students were not really allowed to talk to you. So that's basically how I got my um, information about the school was the staff and, um, then when I decided I was interested in maybe checking it out, going to the school and getting a tour and talking to the administration and that sort of thing. So what was presented to me was presented to me by the school. And so my impression was that I was going to go work with troubled teens. Well, I've interviewed several people who've been sent to Escuela Caribe or similar camps, and they seem to agree that the admins of these institutions target dysfunctional families. So would you agree with that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Not only do they target dysfunctional families by way of outreach, the way they, out, they do their outreach, but um, they... They'll take what a parent says, and then that's the God's truth. That's as far as it goes. There's absolutely no um, advocacy for a kid. For example, a parent calls and says, I'm having problems with my kid, or my kid is ran away and she's staying with her boyfriend um, without any sort of 
research or anything like that we're jumping on a plane with a goon squad and they're showing up at this where this kid is i when i was there we had one girl come hogtied in the back of a car with a giant black eye because she was living she had run away and was living with her boyfriend and when the goon squad arrived to get her she struggled and fell hit her head on the side of a bed and came to us. She struggled so hard, they literally hung tighter. Before, this is actually before she arrived at the camp down in. This is how she arrived. So they, they put her in a car and drove her to the campus. And we basically held her. I mean, the, we basically held her. Now the hog tying, and I, I didn't see it. Um, and I didn't hear about it and, until later, but I certainly saw the black and blue face that she had. And, um, you know, she was young, 13, something like that. Who knows why she ran away? Who knows? We didn't know, we just know what the parents told us. You know, maybe she was escaping something horrible. Most of the staff member, not only do they, do they, um, spend a little bit of time in each campus or some amount of time in each campus. They also tend to go to, to spend time in different roles. Like not only was I a house mother, but I was also a group leader. And I also spent a summer as, um, uh, Oh, what was the, I, I ran a certain class, uh, like, team building type of class you know I was a teacher during Canada and a cook and you just sort of wherever there was positions needed you know I did. but initially I wasn't there but I don't know a few months completely uneducated hadn't had you know dropped out of college and um with very little credits and I um and I was in an office taking kids to counsel. And one of my girls was like 11 years old and she had been, I, I, I guess cause there's no names, I, I can say this stuff, but she had been having sex with her dad since she was five. And all she knew as she, that that was her relationship with her dad and she loved her dad and to her that's love and i am i am there 20 what 22 years old zero education zero training in this day and i'm in an office alone trying to counsel this 11 year old girl God. and that girl got sent back to her dad and her parents and you know with court supervision or we so, so my point being is that you know the these children were coming from horrible homes a lot of times and we just took the the word of the parent there was no you know there was there was no interviewing the kid there was no saying you know what's your take what's going on that sort of thing and if stuff like that came up during counseling it was Anything that the kid said that went against whatever the parent told us was a situation, we, you know, they were told you're out of reality and you're not going to progress until you accept our reality. And that reality is that you are in the fault. You are the problem in this situation and you need to fix yourself, basically. So um, that's kind of the, the MO as it when it comes to um, target, like like you said, targeting families, and and that that's how they dealt with getting kids in. So the way that they targeted the families, they I mean, it had to be a family that you know was going to be down with that kind of. I mean, you know, there's a lot of kids whose parents who really were in trouble, you know, and whose parents really did think that you know this was their best option. You know, mm -hmm. and a lot of times those kids convince their parents that this is this is crazy. You know, we're able to somehow now that didn't happen a whole bunch, but I know it I know from reports from talking to some students that that did, you know, happen, some parents. 
And then some parents after the fact um, were, you know, kind of hip to the fact that it was a really messed up situation and that they were targeted. These schools have had many bad reports, mostly the abuse of children sent there, as you said. Uh, we're talking harsh punishments, beatings, even sexual abuse. Now, I know you had no idea of any of this before you went there, um, went to work as a house parent there, but was it immediately apparent that things weren't quite right at this place, or was it a process of discovery? I would definitely say it was a process of discovery, for sure. And a part of, a lot of that discovery was, um, ended up, being attached to uh, me understanding more about myself and because when you're doing this to someone eventually it comes you know you, you come back and i'm telling someone else this is wrong this is whatever happened over here to you for example if um they were abused or assaulted somehow by their parents or an some kind of relative or whatever and i'm telling them that's wrong you know, that was totally wrong. And it, and I'm saying that, recognizing that at the same time in my own life, because before I went to New Horizons, I had no idea what I suffered through my childhood mm. was considered abuse and assault and that sort of thing, you know? So, um, so as I learned more about myself, I, um, it, you know, I, and I understood, you know, what, what the struggle was within me and, uh, and the responses that I saw happening to the kids in the program and the way they were acting out or whatever felt really, really, um, I was very conflicted about it. Part of the reason that um, part of the reason that added to that conflict was there were kids, there were former students that were staff. So as a staff member that came in, that, that I'm certain that when I came in, Tim Blossom, when he interviewed me, could see from a mile away, you know, my, he could probably, I, you can tell when someone has suffered. You know, especially if you're in the field, when someone has been um, has been a victim of abuse or assault or anything like that for to, for some extended period of time. I mean, there's behavior. There's there's just you know. Now, Tim Blossom was the reverend who started Isquilla Carrera. Is that right? His he's the son of Gordon Blossom, and Gordon Blossom oh, yeah. um, is the one that started it in the early '90s when I. Um, was interviewed by Tim. He was the acting director of the whole shebang. And Gordon Blossom was kind of just this um, consultant, walk in and do little spiritual retreats or whatever kind of a thing. He'd come in and, I don't know, he had his hands in it somehow, but he wasn't the actual working director. And uh, so Tim, was the one I, I had an interview with a few people and Tim was the, because he was the actual director of the whole entire shebang. He interviewed me the last, the, he was the last one to interview me. And, um, which was a really strange interview, but I, I believe he understood. He, I think the pattern is, is that they hire young people who are damaged, you know, who are damaged and can be, and this obviously is all in retrospect 2020 is or hindsight is 2020 but um i the fact that i was hired very coming in very much damaged and not even really ever um dealing with that at all uh i feel like that that was the beginning of, of my own personal, I guess, process of, of realizing what's right, you know, what, what's, 
right and what's wrong when you see people treated so poorly that have that you're saying suffered the same way you did it's almost it's difficult to to reconcile like well if this happened to them and they're getting the shit kicked out of them what well, i mean what's wrong with me like how i don't know it, it is very confusing and so this whole process is messed up because you're i'm operating with a broken perception yeah. you know a, a broken sense of reality and so everything that i'm trying to assess is off kilter for me in my brain and so the whole discovery or a whole a whole way that i processed from going to totally behind the program to this is messed up i need to get out kind of a thing um was super clumsy very um confusing super painful uh very conflicted you know because i loved the people i worked with i loved the kids i believed in the program because there were former students there working that completely believed in the program and it was hard for them and i mean their whole spiel was yeah i would i would have been dead if they didn't kick my ass or that sort of thing and so i mean there's a lot of stuff i think as a as a young staff member coming at you to sort of confuse you how much of that is uh systematic and intentional i i don't know i can't say but it <laughs> but there's a lot of things that point toward it being systematic and intentional um, that I see in hindsight. What was the management like there in general? Did they actively try to suppress dissent from other staff members such as yourself? And were you aware of any disinformation campaigns designed to pacify parents, donors, um, outsiders in general? I wasn't aware of any disinformation campaigns. Um, most of the time it was just silence. Um, when when things would happen that were really sketchy, um, the management structure was was it was very much patriarchal. Like the men, the roles were very very defined, and um, it was it wasn't even it wasn't even subtle. It was like part of the program. Like it is important that the men are the ones that are in control and running the show and are confrontational and the women are not the women are very supportive the women are not in confrontational roles they don't confront kids if i had a kid i mean i a couple times as a house mother i had i was a house mother for the state part of the school which had kids that were placed by the state into our care and some of them were predators and i was a house mother in that house and i had been assaulted by one of those kids and um minorly i you know it and um i couldn't confront them i wasn't allowed to confront them i had to um <clears throat> is this I, due to some sort of biblical edict you know that yeah, the, uh, the, the woman will be submissive yeah. and be quiet and all that kind of thing yeah i don't think patriarchy can exist outside of a biblical context it's I don't know if anybody will buy it outside of some kind of divine right. The upper management was primarily men. And that was by design. I mean, that was how it had to be. Women, absolutely. There were women that were like head counselor or something like that, you know, but there weren't any women that were in um, leadership positions like that. Not very many in the admin. I can think of one, and um, her her power was very limited. And um, she was the wife of one of the directors. So the men were the ones that were running things, and they were in charge, and they were very confrontational. And the women were just supportive and um, non-confrontational. If I was going to confront anybody, it had to be emotionally. For example. When you call me a whore, Johnny, that makes me feel really uncomfortable and unsafe. So that is how I would have to confront something like that um, as a female staff member. Absolutely. So you never then went out of your way to try to advocate any sort of policy change or leniency? Um, did, did, did you try that? And if so, oh. how was that received? Oh, heck no. 
I there's that would have made my life miserable there to be to question the program or I there was I had absolutely no leg to stand on. I was I had zero power, you know. I there I especially in the Squail Creve, they had my passport in a safe. I didn't have it. They had my plane ticket back in a safe. I didn't have it. And um yeah, and I've heard about that. Why do they why do you think they do that? It's just ex exerting control in general. That's my I mean, that's my feeling. What they'll tell you is that they were keeping it safe from the, you know, theft. Mm -hmm. And from, you know, so I mean, but I wasn't like a I wasn't given it. They didn't say, "Hey, do you would you like us to hold your passports or anything like that?" It was just a, and here I am, 22 and you know, I've never done this. I'm I'm working with a bunch of kids who are about my age and some of them are telling my story <laughs> too and I I don't know. It I think, you know, the effectiveness of how they recruit staff members Kind of depends on just kind of keeping them confused or keeping them on edge emotionally or something. So I, I've tried to make sense of why, you know, I didn't say anything because I'm not afraid of confrontation. I'm not. I'm I'm extremely opinionated and I'm intense and I have no problem going toe to toe with anybody. So it. I just, it's one of those things where it will haunt me for the rest of my life. Like, I mean, you can't turn back time and they needed me and, and I ignored, I ignored my intuition. I ignored all of those things and chose to just live in confusion. And I, and it's it's hard for me to make sense of, but I did. I mean, that's how it happened, and that's what but, I did. But you're speaking out against it now, which is a great thing and something you should be very proud of. And then, uh, ho hopefully, what you're what you're saying right now on uh, any future interviews will uh, raise awareness about this problem. Absolutely. So, I guess my next question is, how did you end up leaving Escuela Caribe? Was it suddenly, or yeah. did you have to plan your exit, or um, how did it happen? Well, leaving the DR um, probably would have been a little more difficult for me had I, my mother not died. I was, um, while I was in the Dominican Republic, my mother passed away um, suddenly. And so, you know, I found out and the next day I was on a plane home. So, and um, then I, but I spent two more years in the program. So, I mean, there, I was lost. <laughs> It was, I was lost, um, very close to my mother. This is so, this is hard because I don't want to make it about me. I was very close to my mother and then I'd had all this revelation about stuff that went down in my childhood, which was, you know, not, I mean, my mother was not at all abusive, you know, but, um, and my, and my dad wasn't in the picture at all. So, but it was, it was just a violent home, lots of kids, you know, lots of, so, um, all of that going on, no real way that I took, ah. um, so yeah, I, I had all that, no real way to work through it. And I, it's nothing I even really, um, had admitted to myself yet. So, I mean, I guess the only kind of grace I can really find in the situation for myself is just that massive amount of confusion and feel the feeling that that, that was really super obvious when I was interviewed. And um, maybe they just felt like, you know, I was just one of those people they could just, you know, uh, you know, just, maneuver wherever you know they needed me to do their bidding and easily you know 
So yeah, I left the Dominican Republic. I was in the program for two years and um, I was a house mother and I, um, and the house father that I was a house mother with was new to the house fathering. We ended up getting really close, super good guy, um, but not a good house father at the time. He turned into a good house father because of me, <laughs> but I could have run that house and taken care of those boys on my own all day, every day, 100% better than him. The staff knew it, everybody knew it, but I was put into this submissive, non-confrontational role and I had to deal with a house father who couldn't hold the house together. I was completely exposed. This is when I was assaulted by one of the this is one of one of the students who was a predator. And um so at at that point I you know it just seemed to me like um but there's nothing really happening here except we're collecting money. Nobody's interested in like, why would you, why would you, I just couldn't imagine why they would be okay with that situation. You know, like you are so committed to the fact that women cannot confront that you're going to, you know, leave me in a house unable to protect myself with a man who can't protect me either or is not protecting me and i'm in a house full of predators you know this was the state house and they and it was it was kids we were getting through the courts kids who had who were criminals um um or had been convicted as being juvenile criminals um so and a lot of them were sexual predators so, um, and I'm a strong woman. They put me in the house probably for that reason, you know. So that was it for me. I'm done. This is not, we're not doing anything here. I'm not, you're, this is just, you're housing kids and collecting money. And um, so I walked away, which I feel guilty about too. Mary, are the disenfranchised students and house parents such, such as yourself anywhere doing anything legally about shutting these reform schools down? And can you give our viewers some contacts, maybe websites where they can maybe offer some help? There are a few organizations that I'm aware of that are reaching out to victims of these types of schools. And there are actually students um, that are former student victims from the Escuela Creepy where I worked that are currently talking about ways that um, that we can um, shelter kids coming out of these programs because they're still running, they're still everywhere, bring kids, kids that are graduating out of these programs or being released out of these programs who are completely ill-equipped to deal with the real world. Like, and these kids are, I keep calling them kids. We're all the same age, but in my brain, they're still students. You know, it's it's very weird. But it, so these folks, these former student victims, um, they're working together to try and find ways or to try and set up an organization whereby we can bring in students and put them in homes and help them reassimilate, help them make sense of what just happened to them, let them know it was all wrong, this, you know, that, that sort of thing, because they're not going to get it from their families typically. Their families aren't going to understand. And lots of times that's the issue in the first place, you know. And so I think that is 100% something I want to do, be with them. I feel like my life is. A uh, big part of my life now is just making amends. You're doing you're doing exactly that, and I'm so so proud of you for what you're doing here. And there are some organizations. I mean, I know there are Facebook groups, and there's uh, CSIA, Survivors of Institutional yeah, Abuse. Yeah, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm sorry, I don't. I didn't put together now, but I can later if you wanted to throw them up later. But mm -hmm. 
um, there is the for a New Horizons. I know they have a. Um, they were the the students have organized, um, and Julio Shears was a big part of that, getting the kids organized, getting the former students organized and in contact with each other. And they now, have Julia Shears who wrote Jesus Land. Jesus Land, uh, which is a book about her experiences about 20 years ago in yeah. Esquire the Caribe. Yeah. There is a lot of work we have to do to shut down these places and mm. um, take care of the victims. And for me, Living Amends, that's what that's what it's going to be about for me. But the other part of that is there is in the United States, and I know these are all over the world, but especially in the United States, because we live in a racist patriarchy, we the way the way that we value or not or we do not value children um, is the primary reason cause for all of this. You know, like this is acceptable. This is acceptable in our culture that a parent can decide this kid's wrecking my home, I'm sending him away. Even your uh, vice president, Mike Pence, is in favor of all this, isn't he? Yes, yes. And he is was the governor of Indiana, So, which is where the, the school was, um, where the main campus was. I feel like part of this whole effort to squash this kind of stuff is also about children's rights. In the United States, we don't listen to our teenagers. They get shot up in school and they stand up and make a stand and start talking about politics and everybody makes fun of them. You know, they don't, I, They. it's like, we don't value their voices. We, with the children in the United States, you know, that's the only people that you can legally assault in this country are children in the name of discipline. So this is all just symptomatic of the fact that children and women are viewed as property, things to control, things to make do what you want to do. You know, it's about the male life and the, and the, and the male experience. We're there for them. And um, mind you, it's, this is latent. A lot of it is very explicit, you know, but, uh, but, Primarily, I would say it's very latent, but very deep seated. And those are the things that needed to be need to be addressed. At the same time, we're cleaning up the messes. We need to stop the bleed. You know, we're stopping the bleeding. We're cleaning up the messes, but we need to to get rid of the problem. Like this is the reason that these things exist is because we don't value these kids. We sh they, our nation ships them off, forget about them. Our house, our family is in uproar, not, you know, because of this kid we have decided. And so I, I don't know, there's no advocacy. There's no, a kid can be hogtied and sent to a, a program because the parent says they're the problem. And we're like, yeah, okay, we're buying that. Because we don't value kids, of course. What do kids say? It doesn't matter. They, I mean, they, we don't treat them as individuals. We treat them, they have no say. They can't vote. They don't, they have no say in the way they're schooled, the way that anything, you know. And as parents, parenting in the United States, people don't, you know, for example, this is just an example of kind of trying what I'm, with my girl, for, you know, to say I strap, you know, I put her in the my car seat and we're headed out, and she's misses her lammy. She wanted to take her little lammy, and it's not there. And she's like, I forgot my lammy. Oh my gosh! And we're two miles from home already. In my brain, I'm thinking, what would it be like to be strapped in a car seat, and I forgot the most important thing in my life right now in this moment, and the car is hurtling forward, and I have no options. You know, there's nothing I can do. I mean, that's what I, that, I mean, I feel like that's how we should be thinking about kids, you know? So if I can't go back and get the Lammy, at least I can tell my daughter, I'm so sorry we forgot Lammy. I'll try really hard next time to remember, or in some cases, turn around and go get it.
So put yourself in their place and also remember what it was like to be a kid because everyone was one themselves. Yeah. And they're human beings and individuals and they feel, see, understand things humanly, just like we do, along with caring for taking care of these kids that have been damaged that, you know, coming out of these things. Also working towards just exposing that dynamic in the United States as best as possible and get people to, um, to turn a light on somehow and say, yeah, that is messed up. That's really messed up, you know? Hopefully uh, with what you've, uh, you've said here today, that'll get some people thinking that something has to be done about this. You've said some amazing things here, and I think there's a lot more to be told in this story. So perhaps one day in the not too distant future, you'll come back on to talk beliefs. I'm so grateful that you're doing this. I really am. Thank you from everyone. And thank you too, Mary. <laughs> <laughs>